Um, so uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce the next uh, speaker, uh, Professor Mark Petri. Uh, Professor Petri is a professor of cardiology at the University of Glasgow. His clinical and research interests are in heart failure and peripartum cardiomyopathy. Uh, he has been on the ESC uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy group for, for over 10 years, uh, and he co-authored the 2010 and 2019 position statements on PPCM. Uh, and more importantly, he's been looking after uh, women with PPCM for, for around 20 years. Uh, so who better to give us an update on peripartum cardiomyopathy? Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, thanks, Antonio. I'll uh, just uh, get my slides in place. Yep, so uh, first of all, I'm absolutely thrilled to be talking to an interested group of people about peripartum cardiomyopathy. Uh, when I started looking into this condition many years ago, there was hardly anybody interested and certainly nothing that uh, looked like obstetric cardiology that was uh, functioning with a cardiology slant. So hearing the presentations today is absolutely phenomenal. and also see the attendance is great, so I uh, suspect the quality of care for peripartum cardiomyopathy has gone up exponentially over the years. And it's also important to say this is a team sport, like all the other management of cardiac conditions during pregnancy, uh, teamwork is vital. So certainly when I started off as a cardiologist, uh, I was drawn towards peripartum cardiomyopathy because I thought what other condition could be more uh, emotional or impactful, the, the sort of apparently joyous moment of pregnancy has turned into a really horrible scenario which uh, nobody was planning. And even in the first week of my consultant job, I uh, was faced with uh, managing peripartum cardiomyopathy. And since then, I've been in many, many situations over many years and running an advanced heart failure service where I uh, looked after lots of peripartum cardiomyopathy. Um, within uh, within a large team. So I'm just grateful that everybody is turning to some extent away from putting little metal scaffolds and coronary arteries and uh, concentrating on really important things which you can make a major difference about. So to start off with uh, the definition, uh, again, when I came across peripartum cardiomyopathy, there were some strange things about the definition. Uh, some things such as particular time windows, such as mandating one month before delivery to five months after delivery. So when we wrote this document in 2010, we, we just changed the definition uh, really by writing a very simple statement that this is an idiopathic cardiomyopathy, secondary to left ventricular dysfunction, and very vague wording around towards the end of pregnancy or in the months fo following delivery. Importantly, where no other cause of heart failure is found uh, we'll come back to that in a second. So it's a diagnosis of exclusion. And again, very care careful wording of, about the left ventricle may not be dilated. And the ejection fraction is nearly always reduced below 45%. So lots of vague words there, but I think that reflects the condition. And we were really keen that people didn't automatically exclude somebody because of one particular ejection fraction number um, or LV dilatation. The wording around the no, no other cause of heart failure is found is absolutely vital to read and appreciate. And we're really keen that people look at the patient and think about whether or not they may have another cause of heart failure. So people may have a previous heart failure due to uh, chemotherapeutic agents, or they may have familial dilated cardiomyopathy, or sometimes it's not very clear. And we have a regular arguments or debates and international meetings about whether or not an individual has peripartum cardiomyopathy and, and if in fact um, it's due to something else. This is quite uh, profound and difficult. Uh, there are some quite high profile publications finding uh, abnormal genes in people with peripartum cardiomyopathy and some people interpret that as peripartum cardiomyopathy being a genetic condition and other people interpret it as such as this is actually genetic a heart failure presenting during pregnancy. So really difficult. And actually begs the question, what is peripartum cardiomyopathy? Is it one single entity or is it actually a, a manifestation of, of many different pathophysiological pathways causing cardiac dysfunction in pregnancy? And I suppose the older I get, the more I think it probably has a whole collection of different uh, mechanisms of heart failure, causes of heart failure, some of which are pre-existing and nothing to do with peripartum cardiomyopathy, but some of which are 
uh, different mechanisms that actually present during pregnancy. But again, I'm sure there's many uh, intelligent and well informed people on this call who profoundly disagree with what I've just said. Uh, but I think it's up to us all to try and demonstrate some hard evidence to back up or otherwise. So 10 years after that first position paper, we published uh, this uh, registry. So it was a heart failure association of the European Society of Cardiology registry that we spent a long time putting together. And this is the first paper uh, which came out of that, published uh, 18 months ago in the European Heart Journal. So this looks internationally at a registry of people with peripartum cardiomyopathy. Um, and we tried to use this regist registry to learn several things. And this paper published a six month outcome. So this was not an easy business. If you start working with uh, a large pharma company on the new trial, you have thousands of people at your disposal and you uh, can steer a, a very large trial towards an easy conclusion. Studying something like peripartum cardiomyopathy internationally is a tough gig. So you can see how slowly we recruited and we really relied on our, our similarly passionate colleagues uh, in many countries. But eventually we got to 756 patients, which I think in anybody's book is a pretty reasonable effort to study a condition such as this. So you can see uh, the various um, sites that are around the world. Uh, we really did recruit uh, internationally. I'll show you shortly. There's not many people in um, the Americas or Australia who eventually ended up in the registry. And we eventually ended up with 598 people with known vital status at six months. So this is the split. So you can see 40% uh, in Africa, 27% in Europe, 23% uh, in the Middle East, and 7% in what we called uh, Asia Pacific. So not ideal. Obviously, we'd like to have people, some consecutive people in every country in the world, but that's unachievable. But this is as good as it got. So I'm just going to pick out a few interesting things from this paper, uh, things which uh, are clinically relevant and striking. So first of all, symptom onset to diagnosis. Uh, we found that uh, the median uh, was 10 days from symptom onset to diagnosis uh, with uh, interquartile ranges of 3 to 34. So, so really a lot of people waiting a long time before the clinicians recognise that they have heart failure during pregnancy. And it's amazing if you talk to colleagues, uh, quite a few midwives have never heard of peripartum cardiomyopathy. It's not a high profile condition, but I really think it should be mandatory for people looking after uh, pregnant women to at least have an understanding of what to look out for um, in terms of uh, alarming symptoms or signs or clinical presentations that may reflect peripartum cardiomyopathy. So if any of you are interested and get a chance to speak to any large bodies, then I think it's a really important thing to do to try and highlight uh, the simple things that steer cardiologists towards something going wrong, such as tachycardia or just somebody not looking quite right. So symptoms of diagnosis, again, this is quite striking. So uh, two thirds of people presenting with peripartum cardiomyopathy in this large registry were class three or class four. So either breathless at rest or, or, or minimal exertion. And to me, this rings alarm bells, and I, I am firmly convinced that we only recognise the very severe end of the spectrum of peripartum cardiomyopathy. There's lots of women who are fatigued and a bit breathless with ankle swelling. Uh, after they deliver, we don't receive a diagnosis, and we really don't have a clear idea how common peripartum cardiomyopathy is, because really, people have to be uh, really sick before uh, the penny drops in many clinicians' minds. So again, there's lots of opportunities for research and study here, and I would absolutely love to see a large uh, cohort study looking at people's hearts during pregnancy, uh, looking at cardiac biomarkers and imaging to see how common this is. And certainly it's very obvious we don't capture everybody if, if the diagnosis is almost exclusively made in hospital and people who are extraordinarily sick. Again, this is a problem as well. So symptoms and signs, this is signs, but about half of people have things like crackles and um, peripheral edema, so, so pulmonary crepitations and peripheral edema, uh, just under a half of jugular venous dis distension and some have a third heart sound. But tachycardia or some or high heart rate is pretty common. So depressingly, some people who are not cardiologists think that before you have heart failure, you have to, before you can diagnose heart failure, you have to wait for people to have uh, pulmonary crackles or ankle swelling. And we all know from all aspects of cardiology and heart failure care 
that young people with heart failure hardly ever get ankle swelling, or not hardly ever, they, they don't commonly get ankle swelling and crackles in their lungs. So we try and encourage uh, general practitioners and uh, midwives to, to just think about peripartum cardiomyopathy. And if they see somebody uh, who looks unwell with a fast heart rate, then to consider um, investigating for peripartum cardiomyopathy. Obviously, we don't know exactly when to do that, when not to do that, and we don't want to overburden uh, the echocardiogram services of people who uh, don't have heart failure. But I think we should encourage a high index of suspicion and certainly not wait for somebody to be at death's door uh, before we investigate them. So just to talk about some other findings from this registry, uh, this is six month uh, maternal mort mortality. So that's roughly 6% across the whole cohort. So 6% of women die, which again can be encouraging for somebody who's lying in an intensive care unit or a, or a coronary care unit. If you give them figures like 94% of people are likely to survive, that's pretty good news to, to most people. Uh, again, you can see the regional variation here is quite stark. So 10% of people in the Middle East, 4% uh, in Europe, 5% Africa and 8% Asia Pacific. So quite a, a variation whether this, this is due to uh, differences uh, in the disease process or a difference in, in management, uh, we obviously can't tell from data such as these, but uh, certainly a broad regional variation. So how do these people die? So uh, uh, the, the commonest cause of death, heart failure, 42%. Sudden death, which obviously is uh, pretty awful, 30%. And that's important because, you know, you, you I quite often feel impassioned when somebody has a very severe, uh, uh, very severe heart failure, reduced life and trigger function. You think about putting an ICD in, and the Germans are very keen on life vests. Uh, but it's it's really is difficult to know when to do these to to pursue these strategies. And certainly ICDs here are very difficult because we see such a high rate of myocardial recovery, even in people with presenting ejection fractions. Uh, just in case you implant an ICD to somebody who doesn't need it, and then you end up with a young woman looking at decades of um, device-related uh, challenges. So uh, the sudden death rate is there. It's uh, difficult. You, you know, clearly, if you get somebody back in and they've got recurrent heart failure or repeat hospitalizations, you can manage that. Uh, you can think about VADs or transplant or whatever. But sudden death is really the big, the big challenge. And stroke as well, that's important. So 15% of people have it, have stroke. And I'll show you some data around thromboembolic complications later. So maternal mortality, so this is a six month report. You can see people don't, you, you think that if they're gonna die, they're gonna die in the first few days. And you can see that a bit here, but actually there's a, there's a steady death rate over the first six months. And I'll show you some data later on about ongoing mortality in cohorts with uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy. So this is really difficult, uh, you know, because Often when you manage somebody through the first four days and they look a bit better, you, you get uh, reassured, but you really can't let your guard down. You need to be as careful as possible and try and manage these people as well as possible. So what about myocardial recovery? Again, I won't dwell too much on the definition of myocardial recovery across um, different disease states and heart failure, but uh, uh, for the purposes of this analysis, it's above 50% um, ejection fraction. So again, you can see that the, the overall recovery rate, this is six months, myocardial recovery rate um, was 46%, with again, quite a marked regional variation, 57% in Europe, 62% uh, in Asia Pacific, only 25% Middle East and 37% in Africa. So really quite uh, not very encouraging and pr probably my clinical practice, this looks a bit low. And again, I'll show you some data from other, other studies uh, later. Whenever you do registries like this, you have to be concerned that you do have a representative population. And uh, to be frank, you know, some of these centres that were recruiting patients were uh, uh, advanced heart failure units looking at really sick ends of the, of the population. So maybe that um, played a role here. But of course, you would have to make the same argument about mortality. So without hospitalizations, again, about 10% all cause through hospitalization rate over the first six months. Uh, about half of these were heart failure and half were uh, non-heart failure causes of rehospitalization. So not a massive um, rehospitalization rate, but certainly reasonable for young women. Thromboembolism, this is something which uh, occurred to me early on looking after these patients that quite commonly I would see people admitted to hospital and the presenting symptom was something like a stroke or uh, an, an upper limb embolism or a DVT or something. So 
this does happen and it's about seven percent of people at six months that had a thromboembolic event most of these were venous and a, a few arterial so this actually in my clinical practice i thought this would be higher uh, but it would these these are the numbers we found from the registry so I used to really think about formally anticoagulating coagulating people when they presented with peripartum cardiomyopathy because of my anecdotal experience. But these data have been fascinating. And in fact, what usually happens is people present with thromboembolic presentations uh, when they initially present with peripartum cardiomyopathy. But actually, when we followed them up in the registry, very few people had a thromboembolic event after um, they were started in heart failure therapies and had their initial hospital stay on low molecular weight heparin. So uh, these are these are interesting data, and certainly my clinical practice was changed by these data. And I don't routinely anticoagulate people following diagnosis now. What we do do though is we are, have a low threshold for performing cardiac MRIs and looking for thrombus um, in in the heart, which I think is a pretty good practice if you've got access to. Um, to cardiac MRI. So, you know, again, think about it, uh, look at the individual patient, but certainly anticoagulating everybody is, is not justified, I don't think, on the basis of current data. So neonatal mortality, uh, if we look across um, the, this uh, registry, about 5% um, of neonates died in this cohort. Again, a big regional variation, 2% in Europe, 9% Middle East, uh, four and five percent um, in Asia Pacific and Africa. So a reasonable um, neonatal mortality rate. So this is a summary graphic that we put in our European um, Heart Journal paper. I'm not going to go through it in detail, but just trying to summarize uh, the really important uh, things I think everybody should know about peripartum cardiomyopathy. But again, saying that this is a large registry, but there's certainly if there's young enthusiastic people on the call, there's lots of scope for a lot more um, international research here if you have the, the energy and the passion. So moving on away from the registry to other data, uh, this is uh, a real bugbear of mine. People call peripartic cardiomyopathy a rare disease. And quite often you see that in the first sentence of publications. I'm not sure it is rare. I've already said, I, I don't think we, we identify it unless it's a, you know, very severe and almost killing people. So I don't know how common it is. There's lots of um, reasonable data. Some of the data are uh, from national registries, such as the Danes and the Swedes. And these data do suggest it's not that common. So about one in 10,000 in Denmark, one in 6,000 um, in Sweden. There are some real hot spots in the world. Uh, Nigeria, that's one in 100. I hate it, one in 300. But again, a lot of these studies are, are not the highest quality and they don't always have cardiac imaging or cardiac biomarkers and they can be reports of, of uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy. Uh, in uh, South Africa, it looks like about one in one in a thousand, which is mirrored by the African-American population in America and whites in America, it looks less common. But really, th these are data which give us a flavour of how common peri peripartum cardiomyopathy is. But again, if you look across large obstetric services delivering thousands of babies over the years, uh, you know this does happen in each um, uh, obstetric unit. So I think people should be um, alert and aware. So unanswered questions again, you know, uh, epidemiology studies, population-based ones certainly have major limitations. I've already said several times that we only recognise the severe end of the spectrum, and I would love somebody to do a prospective unselected cohort internationally. Um, looking uh, at the heart in detail uh, in people with assessments of uh, both cardiac function and also uh, biomarkers as well. And of course, consecutive recruitment is much uh, favoured in terms of recruiting to a registry by enthusiasts uh, who may not see a truly representative cohort. So what should we be doing to investigate uh, a woman with suspected peripartum cardiomyopathy? So I drew this uh, very quickly in about 20 minutes one night writing this paper, and I don't really believe it's probably what we should be doing. So seeing a breathless woman towards the end of pregnancy or early postpartum, we should be thinking about ECG or natural peptides and echocardiography. I typed in a, a foolish moment in my younger days. I think if we did, we echoed an ECG and BNP, everybody uh, who is breathless towards the end of pregnancy, we might uh, cause major trouble. But I was trying to be thought provoking and trying to make people think. But certainly, I think we should have a low threshold if we do think somebody has peripartum cardiomyopathy to do 
cardiovascular tests and uh, we flagged uh, people should look for alternative causes of uh, the cardiovascular presentation rather than just assign things straight in a straightforward way to peripartum cardiomyopathy. And also it's, it's important to look for non-cardiovascular causes of breathlessness. So the utopia uh, would be some biomarker, maybe some blood biomarker that was specific and sensitive for peripartum cardiomyopathy. And I've also been a bit cheeky there looking at subgroups of peripartum cardiomyopathy because again, I'm pretty sure there's different mechanisms involved, which I'll come back to a little bit later on. And a blood test for peripartum cardiomyopathy doesn't seem crazy to me, uh, particularly for subgroups. So uh, we've, I've already shown you data from the registry about um, six months mortality in the registry, but I just wanted to flag some other um, data across lots of countries. These are not high quality studies. These are generally um, single centre or, or a few centres putting their data together. But you, it's just to emphasise the wide variation in reports of six months mortality. You see uh, some reports, uh, the Germans, for instance, very low 2% and South Africans 25 to 30% and relatively large cohorts in the States with 3%. So really large variation. So going beyond six months, uh, we were very interested to look at long term prognosis. And I've got to say thanks to Alice Jackson, who's one of our fellows, who's done a huge amount of work in this area and has contributed massively to a lot of these papers. So she looked at long term prognosis here as well as things like subsequent pregnancy, which I'll come back to. But this we just kind of give you a flavour of long term prognosis. So going beyond six months, again, we've got a variety of data. Again, I don't want to over praise the quality of these uh, studies, but internationally, uh, you know, wide variation in mortality from somewhere around 2% to somewhere around 14%. Again, the, the outliers, the higher, higher mortality being um, in South Africa. Going a bit further out, uh, we get again differences, uh, particularly highlighting this IPAC registry, which is a registry in the States. Uh, four percent um, between one and two years, and again some other countries, Haiti, South Africa, are reporting higher mortality rates. And going beyond um, two years, we've also seen data from two to five years. Again, uh, some surprising results in uh, Brazil. Again, you wonder what the mechanism of the heart failure presentations there might be, and of course we see things like Chagas disease there pretty prevalently, so our people get confused between peripartum cardiomyopathy and other forms of heart failure, and in Turkey as well. And longer term outcomes, so great in the five years, again, Nigeria, um, you know, various other countries uh, suggesting higher mortality, India and Malaysia there at the bottom, 8%. So I'm not going to go through these in detail, but I'm just giving you a flavour of the quality of these data for long term outcome, not, not fantastic quality data. From the ESC registry, we're going to have we're going to have we've got one year paper prepared. I can't show you the results of that yet, but it's uh, we've got one year uh, publication. By the time we get to two years, the follow up had fallen beyond uh, what was useful in terms of data. So again, just uh, more uh, individual cohorts. It's just emphasising people don't just die in the first month; they can die later on. So we need to be very clear that we continue to manage people beyond their. Um, initial presentation and not celebrate when the patient goes home. So unanswered questions again, same criticism again, large unselected cohorts would be great, international, really looking at the cause of death in detail. And also again, before we can improve care, we need to understand the cause of death and are they preventable? So moving on to recovery again, I've shown you the figures for the registry, the six months data from the registry. This is, uh, these are other data, uh, particularly some strong data from Denmark suggesting that uh, by a year, maybe 83% of people have recovered. So that's as more like what I see in clinical practice. And again, this is data from the IPAC group, Dennis McNamara's group in the States, 72% uh, at one year, again, a good cohort. But then you see this other end of the spectrum, uh, these uh, studies such as Pakistan and uh, South Africa with uh, much lower rates of recovery. So really um, broad, uh, and I suppose uncertain rates of recovery, uh, but again, I think if you say 50%, you certainly won't be um, overestimating recovery. But when I talk to patients, I'm giving them a flavour of maybe around 70% um, recovery. So again, late recovery is interesting. So again, not great literature here, but uh, quite a few studies following people well beyond the six months that was in the registry and the classic uh, myocardial recovery studies in peripartum cardiomyopathy showing 
um, recovery a lot beyond six months. So you don't have to uh, despair at six months or indeed make ICD decisions or transplant decisions unless they're necessary, um, but, you know, too early. So you can see late myocardial recovery. And again, for those interested in uh, enriching their lives by doing research, there's a whole bunch of things that can be done here, looking at you know, predictors of recovery mechanisms, the whole issue around um, the different subsets of peripartum cardiomyopathy and who may or may not recover. So really great areas. So a really big clinical question is, should heart failure drugs be stopped when you see myocardial recovery? And again, there's conflicting literature here, small studies, nothing that we really can hang our hats on. Again, we uh, have to be aware of Chet HF, uh, Brian Halliday's fantastic uh, small study in delayed cardiomyopathy, which included a couple of people with peripartum cardiomyopathy, but suggested we should be, be carrying on drug therapy in, in heart failure with recovered life and checkup function, because if we stop the drugs, the heart gets worse again. So that's difficult in peripartum cardiomyopathy because you generally have a woman in their 20s or 30s uh, who's looking at many, many decades, hopefully, of life. So uh, for me, this is a discussion with individual patients. Some people are happy to stay on the tablets longer term. Some people want to stop. If you want to stop or wean, you can think about which drugs to wean or stop. For me, beta blockers are the last ones to wean or stop because they probably stop this or reduce the chances of sudden cardiac death. But you can discuss the other, the other agents as well. Brian was discussing uh, potentially performing a trial called TRED PBCM to actually formally assess uh, stopping uh, r failure drugs and recovered left ventricular function. But uh, I've not heard from him for a couple of years about that, but I don't think that's proceeded. But it would be great to see a detailed MRI biomarker study um, really looking at uh, what happens when you stop drugs. So subsequent pregnancies, again, that's really, really important area. And whenever you're talking to women and their families over the weeks and months after diagnosis, they have a whole list of questions, uh, first of all, about their mortality and their own hearts recovering. But then subsequent pregnancy always comes um, as one of the next questions. So I'm not going to read through all these questions, but it's all the questions about should they have become pregnant? What's the chances of recurrent uh, heart failure during the pregnancies or dying during further pregnancy? Uh, will, the, will, the, will the baby be okay or not? Uh, and, you know, the whole process about can they, how do they get pregnant? Uh, and I'm sure that you you all now work in the cardiobstetric services where we ensure that we give people contraceptive advice before they go home. And we give them advice about uh, education and, and counselling and advice about getting pregnant um, or not getting pregnant on heart failure therapies and certainly working with the cardiopsychic team um, discussing any future pregnancy and coming off the drugs that they need to before with some monitoring and then uh, conceiving in a relatively controlled fashion and being monitored through pregnancy. So loads of issues uh, to talk about. One thing which I uh, always wary of and when it, clearly when somebody's just come out of hospital and nearly died of peripartum cardiomyopathy they always swear they're ever going to become pregnant again, but I can tell you that's, uh, you know, please don't pay too much attention to women when they say that and invite them and make, make sure they've got a very clear pathway back towards the cardiopsychic team to discuss future pregnancies. So uh, really important. I suppose one other thing to say, and uh, Maggie Simpson, one of my colleagues in Glasgow, is always very keen to stress is that when we give this counselling before they go home about contraception and future pregnancies, please document it in the case notes because it's really important. and. Uh, certainly, you know, I'm I'm really keen to make sure I do that because if people come in again and, and they've not, uh, they can't recall the conversation, it's nice to document it. Obviously, it'd be nice to give them some literature, but I'm not aware of any great literature in this area. So subsequent pregnancies, what are the facts behind subsequent pregnancies? So uh, just looking across the piece, again, this is another paper we published a few years ago looking at subsequent pregnancies. And re really, um, if we look at subsequent pregnancies, we can... Uh, look at the, all the studies together and approximately the risk of recurrent um, LB dysfunction or heart failure during subsequent pregnancies is may, maybe about 30%, 35% if you look across the trials. Uh, the, the mortality you can see there's not high. Uh, the one at the bottom there um, was a, a, a multinational uh, effort we contributed to, which we saw uh, four deaths, which, contribute, which was 12% of the population. So that was a bit higher than others. These two papers are particularly important, and the uh, paper by Jim Fett and Yuri Elkheim 
the, these divided up people uh, with peripartum chiropathy going into a subsequent pregnancy to recovered and unrecovered LV function. So if you look at people with recovered LV function, there was no people dying in these cohorts or just over 100 people combined. So no deaths and about 20% recurrent LV dysfunction. And if their ventricles not recovered, there was a few deaths um, and about almost a 50% or, or 40 to 50% uh, recurrence rate of LV dysfunction or heart failure. So in my simplistic mind, what I do is I put that together for patients and see if LV function is recovered, uh, the risk of uh, having recurrent heart failure is about 25% and a very small risk of death. And if it's not recovered, 50% risk of recurrent heart failure hospitalization and 10% risk of death. So I'm keen to present these kinds of data. They're not great data. They're not based on huge studies, but I think it's it's useful. I personally don't quote the World Health Organization because I think we should be more specific about individual uh, conditions and use the literature that we've got. But I appreciate that that's a controversial thing to say. The other um, thing that people do when they manage a lot of subsequent pregnancies is, is look for very low risk cohorts. And this is a, um, a, a study by Jim Fett looking at using stress echo uh, to look at recovered LV function. Just so if somebody's got an ejection fraction above 55 percent and uh, they don't have any abnormalities in stress echo, then it looks like the, the risk of recurrent heart failure is very low. So I think this is a reasonable thing to do to do a stress echo in addition to arresting um, it, uh, baseline ejection fraction uh, to see if you, if you can risk stratify the patients to some extent. Uh, th these data look excellent. I'm not sure life is quite as simple as that, but I think it's certainly a reasonable thing to do. So just to summarise, uh, post substance pregnancy, you have to um, review and counsel pre-pregnancy uh, with an appropriate team. And again, teamwork here is absolutely vital. And I really don't think individual cardiologists should be managing these people by themselves without any specialist nurse input and without any communication with obstetricians. I really think that's a should be a thing of the past. Uh, already discovered when you, you're thinking about conceiving, people should come off their ACE inhibitors and MRAs, surveillance during pregnancy and delivery. And Tony, have I gone over time? Have I? Yeah. Yeah. No, you're fine. Yeah. OK, OK. Just wrapping up. Yeah. OK, yeah, so uh, bromocryptine, I'll just talk about just for a few seconds. So bromocryptine for peripartum cardiomyopathy. Some people think this is a, a great treatment. So just to give you a flavour for why it might be a good idea, uh, there's a theory of oxidative stress activates cathectin D and prolactin is converted to uh, this abnormal um, prolactin 60 kilodalton prolactin, which mediates the adverse cardiovascular effects. Uh, bromocryptine suppresses prolactin, so that's the the theory behind why bromocryptine might be a good treatment for peripartum cardiomyopathy. So the data around this are not strong. This is a very um, good paper uh, by Karen Sluba, but a really small number of patients, uh, 20 patients in South Africa, randomised to bromocryptine or placebo. You can see that nobody died in the bromocryptine arm. Four people out of 10 died in placebo. To this uh, looked like bromocryptine was a fantastic treatment. The Germans um, did a trial. They said they couldn't get ethical approval for placebo arm, so they compared um, eight weeks against one week of bromocryptine and didn't find any change. So I think that was a missed opportunity to do a randomised placebo controlled trial and didn't really inform us very much. The Canadians set a trial up and uh, they failed to deliver the trial and it turned into a retrospective um, case series of eight patients, which is depressing. But there is a large trial now going on in the, in the US called Rebirth, led by the IPAC group, Dennis McNamara, 250 patients looking at um, ejection fraction as a primary outcome. So I think that's really important and should be delivered. Most people don't use bromocryptine. It's only 1% of pregnancies in the US, 7% um, in the EU and outside the EU, there are some enthusiasts. So I think there's, there's some potential cons of using bromocryptine as well as pros, so most of us don't use it. Uh, the recommendations in the guidelines reflect the lack of evidence or the, or the relatively weak evidence with a 2B B recommendation. So again, I'm not going to talk about mechanisms too much, but there, there's a load of different me uh, proposed mechanisms of peripartum cardiomyopathy, uh, which may or may not uh, represent subgroups of peripartum cardiomyopathy. But again, if, if there's researchers there, uh, lots of studies uh, looking at the different patient profiles would be fantastic. My personal opinion is that I'm sure there's lots of different mechanisms that result in cardiac dysfunction during pregnancies. Maybe sometimes there's single single mechanisms, sometimes there's multiple mechanisms, uh, but we could have a good discussion. 
in the interest of time, I won't go through anticoagulation too much, but again, it, it is used uh, quite a lot. But as I've already said, I think probably not uh, with a firm evidence base. So look for cardiac um, thrombus, and if, he, if it's present, then an uh, anticoagulator. If somebody presents with a thrombobolic presentation, then of, of course they should be on anticoagulation. I've mentioned sudden death briefly. There are some enthusiasts in the world that send everybody home with a life vest on. I think that's a major thing to do from a psychological aspect, and I'm not sure the true benefit. ICDs in my practice, I certainly don't implant ICDs too early uh, because, again, a young woman with an ICD and with a recovered ventricle is a depressing sight. But again, we have implanted ICDs which have appropriately discharged. The subcutaneous ICD is also an option as well. So uh, again, lots of papers about acute heart failure and how to manage acute heart failure. I think the summary here is that you should have a multidisciplinary team uh, with uh, good heart failure doctors, uh, good intensive care doctors, obstetricians, paediatricians and surgeons managing people together. Outcomes of cardiotransplantation are worse in people with peripartum cardiomyopathy than uh, people without. Uh, that's the whole a lot of theories about why that is and whether it's, whether it's due to um, immune mechanisms. And uh, left ventricular assist devices can be necessary, but again, we shouldn't be too trigger happy with left ventricular assist devices because of the high recovery rates. There are some parts of the world where I think people receive these uh, devices where maybe it's not strictly necessary. So drugs um, during lactation and during pregnancy um, is really important. And we've already heard about that during the, this um, this uh, session. My personal practice is to go back and look at the, the exactly which drugs you can and can't use during pregnancy and lactation uh, every time I see a woman like this. And we, uh, Alice Jackson and myself and a pharmacist called Paul Forsyth, put this table together and it's in this publication where we graded things red as in don't do it, green you can do it, and uh, amber if we're not quite sure. So if you want to look up this publication, whenever you're looking after a woman, please do. I think that's the helpful thing to do. Again, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but there's loads of questions which are unanswered in peripartum cardiomyopathy, so we should be investigating these in detail. So conclusions, uh, exciting times. What is peripartum cardiomyopathy? It sounds like a silly thing to say, but it really is important to think about uh, investigating the pathophysiology and all the different aspects of, of peripartum cardiomyopathy, which I've outlined today. There are massive gaps in our understanding. The therapies I've listed there, we don't have any really great specific therapies and we probably will understand probocrictine a bit more after the rebirth um, study. But just to go come back full circle, just talk about team management, multidisciplinary management, really important. Uh, get some really interested nurses involved, get, get some interested obstetricians, uh, paediatricians, surgeons, and get a good team together to try and make sure you look after these people as well as possible. So thank you very much for listening. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Petrie, for a comprehensive lecture on peripartum cardiomyopathy, and uh, thanks for uh, advertising so many research ideas uh, in the field.